Story twenty seven of Abaft the Funnel by Rudyard Kipling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story twenty seven My Great and Only whether MacDougall or MacDoodle be his name, the principle remains the same, as Mrs. Nickleby said. The gentleman appeared to hold authority in London, and by virtue of his position preached or ordained that music halls were vulgar, if not improper. Subsequently I gathered that the gentleman was inciting his associates to shut up certain music halls on the ground of the vulgarity aforesaid and I saw with my own eyes that unhappy little managers were putting notices into the corners of their programmes, begging the audience to report each and every impropriety. That was pitiful, but it excited my interest. Now, to the upright and impartial mind, which is mine, all the diversions of heathendom, which is the British, are of equal ethnological value and it is true that some human beings can be more vulgar in the act of discussing etchings additions of luxury or their own emotions than other human beings employed in swearing at each other across the street therefore following a chain of thought which does not matter i visited very many theatres whose licences had never been interfered with there i discovered men and women who lived and moved and behaved according to rules which in no sort regulate human life by tradition dead and done with and after the customs of the more immoral ancients and barnum at one place the lodging-house servant was an angel and her mother a madonna at a second they sounded the loud timbrel or a whirl of bloody axes mobs and brown paper castles and said it was not a pantomime but art at a third everybody grew fabulously rich and fabulously poor every twenty minutes which was confusing at a fourth they discussed the nudities and ludities in false pallet voices supposed to belong to the aristocracy and that tasted copper in the mouth at a fifth they merely climbed up walls and threw furniture at each other which is notoriously the custom of spinsters and small parsons next morning the papers would write about the progress of the modern drama that was the silver paper pantomime and graphic presentment of the realities of our highly complex civilization that was the angel housemaid by the way when an englishman has been doing anything more than unusually pagan he generally consoles himself with over civilization it's the martyr to nerves dear note in his equipment i went to the music halls the less frequented ones and they were almost as dull as the plays but they introduced me to several elementary truths ladies and gentlemen in eccentric but not altogether unsightly costumes told me a that if i got drunk i should have a head next morning and perhaps be fined by the magistrate b that if i flirted promiscuously i should probably get into trouble c that i had better tell my wife everything and be good to her or she would be sure to find out for herself and be very bad to me d that i should never lend money or e fight with a stranger whose form i did not know my friends if i may be permitted to so call them illustrated these facts with personal reminiscences and drove them home with kicks and prancings at intervals circular ladies in pale pink and white would low to their audience to the effect that there was nothing half so sweet in life as love's young dream and the billycock hats would look at the four and eleven penny bonnets and they saw that it was good and clasped hands on the strength of it then other ladies with shorter skirts would explain that when their husbands stagger home tight about two and can't light the candle we take the broomandle and show em what women can do naturally the billycocks seeing what might befall thought things over again and you heard the bonnets murmuring softly under the clink of the lager glasses not me bill not me 
Now these things are basic and basaltic truths. Anybody can understand them. They are as old as time. Perhaps the expression was occasionally what might be called coarse, but beer is beer, and best in a pewter, though you can, if you please, drink it from Venetian glass, and call it something else. The halls give wisdom, and not too lively entertainment for sixpence. Ticket good for four penneth of refreshments, chiefly inky porter, and the people who listen are respectable folk, living under very grey skies, who derive all the light side of their life, the food for their imagination, and the crystallized expression of their views on fate and nemesis, from the affable ladies and gentlemen singers. They require a few green and gold maidens in short skirts to kick before them. Herein they are no better and no worse than folk who require fifty girls very much undressed, and a setting of music or pictures that won't let themselves be seen on account of their age and varnish, or statues and coins. All animals like salt, but some prefer rock salt, red or black, in lumps. But this is a digression. Out of my many visits to the hall, I chose one hall, you understand, and frequented it till I could tell the mood it was in before I had passed the ticket pole, was born the great idea. I served it as a slave for seven days. Thought was not sufficient. Experience was necessary. I patrolled Westminster, Blackfriars, Lambeth, the Old Kent Road, and many, many more miles of pitiless pavement to make sure of my subject. At even I drank my lager among the billycocks, and lost my heart to a bonnet, Goethe and Shakespeare were my precedents. I sympathized with them acutely, but I got my message. A chance-caught refrain of a song, which I understand is protected, to its maker I convey my most grateful acknowledgments, gave me what I sought. The rest was made up of four elementary truths, some humor, and, though I say it, who should leave it to the press, pathos, deep and genuine. I spent a penny on a paper which introduced me to a great and only who wanted new songs. The people desired them, really. He was their ambassador, and taught me a great deal about the property right in songs, concluding with a practical illustration, for he said my verses were just the thing and annexed them. It was long before he could hit on the step-dance which exactly elucidated the spirit of the text and longer before he could jingle a pair of huge brass spurs as a dancing girl jingles her anklets. That was my notion, and a good one. The great and only possessed a voice like a bull, and nightly roared to the people at the heels of one who was winning triple encores with a priceless ballad beginning deep down in the bass, We was shopmates, booze and shopmates. I feared that song as Rachel feared Ristori. A greater than I had written it. It was a grim tragedy, lighted with lucid humor, wedded to music that maddened. But my great and only had faith in me, and I, I clung to the great heart of the people, my people, four hundred when it's all full, sir. I had not studied them for nothing. I must reserve the description of my triumph for another turnover. There was no portent in the sky on the night of my triumph. A barrel full of onions, indeed, upset itself at the door, but that was a coincidence. The hall was crammed with billycocks waiting for we was shopmates. The great heart beat healthily. I went to my beer, the equal of Shakespeare and Moliere, at the wings in a fist-fight. What would my public say? Could anything live after the abandon of We Was Shopmates? What if the redcoats did not muster in their usual strength? Oh, my friends, never in your songs and dramas forget the redcoat. He has sympathy and enormous boots. I believed in the redcoat, in the great heart of the people, above all in myself. The conductor, who advertised that he doctored bad songs, 
had devised a pleasant little lilting air for my needs, but it struck me as weak and thin after the thunderous surge of the shopmates. I glanced at the gallery. The redcoats were there. The fiddle-bows creaked, and with a jingle of brazen spurs, a forage-cap over his left eye, my great and only began to chuck it off his chest. Thus— at the back of the Knightsbridge barracks, when the fog was a gatherin' dim, the lifeguard talked to the undercook, and the girl she talked to him. Twiddle diddle iddle little tum 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 said the violins. Ling a ling a ling a ling a ling ting ling said the spurs of the great and only, and through the roar in my ears, I fancied I could catch a responsive hoof beat in the gallery. The next four lines held the house to attention. Then came the chorus and the borrowed refrain. It took. It went home with a crisp click. My great and only saw his chance. Superbly waving his hand to embrace the whole audience, he invited them to join in. You may make a mistake when you're mashing a tart, but you'll learn to be wise when you're older, and don't try for things that are out of your reach, and that's what the girl told the soldier, 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 and that's what the girl told the soldier. I thought the gallery would never let go of the long-drawn howl on soldier. They clung to it as ringers to the kicking bell-rope. Then I envied no one, not even Shakespeare. I had my house hooked, gaffed under the gills, netted, speared, shot behind the shoulder, anything you please. That was pure joy. With each verse the chorus grew louder, and when my great and only had bellowed his way to the fall of the lifeguard and the happy lot of the undercook, the gallery rocked again, the reserved stalls shouted, and the pewters twinkled like the legs of the demented ballet girls. The conductor waved the now frenzied orchestra to softer Lydian strains. My great and only warbled piano. At the back on night's bridge barracks, when the fog's a gathering dim, the lifeguard waits for the undercook, but she won't wait for him. Ta ra 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 rang a horn, clear and fresh as a sword cut. Twas the apotheosis of virtue. She's married a man in the poultry line that lives at Eygate Hill, and the lifeguard walks with the housemaid now, and, awful pause, she can't foot the bill. Who shall tell the springs that move masses? I had builded better than I knew. Followed yells, shrieks, and wildest applause. Then, as a wave gathers to the curl-over, singer and sung to fill their chests and heave the chorus through the quivering roof, alto, horns, basses drowned and lost in the flood, to the beach-like boom of beating feet. Oh, think of my song when you're going at strong and your boots is too little to old your, and don't try for things that is out of your reach, and that's what the girl told the soldier, soldier, soldier. Ow, ay, yai, wahoo, pew, woo, pit, bang, wang, crash. There was ample time for the variations as the horns uplifted themselves, and ere the held voices came down in the foam of sound. That's what the girl told the soldier. Providence has sent me several joys, and I have helped myself to others. But that night, as I looked across the sea of tossing billycocks and rocking bonnets, my work, as I heard them give tongue, not once, but four times, their eyes sparkling, their mouths twisted with the taste of pleasure, I felt that I had secured perfect felicity. I am become greater than Shakespeare. I may even write plays for the Lyceum, but I never can recapture that first fine rapture that followed the upheaval of the Anglo-Saxon four hundred of him and her. They do not call for authors on these occasions, but I desired no meed of public recognition. I was placidly happy. 
the chorus bubbled up again and again throughout the evening and a redcoat in the gallery insisted on singing solos about a swine in the poultry line whereas i had written man and the pewters began to fly and afterwards the long streets were vocal with various versions of what the girl had really told the soldier and i went to bed murmuring i have found my destiny but it needs a more mighty intellect to write the songs of the people some day a man will rise up from bermondsey battersea or bow and he will be coarse but clear-sighted hard but infinitely and tenderly humorous speaking the people's tongue steeped in their lives and telling them in swinging urging dinging verse what it is that their inarticulate lips would express he will make them songs such songs and all the little poets who pretend to sing to the people will scuttle away like rabbits for the girl which as you have seen of course is wisdom will tell that soldier which is hercules bowed under his labours all that she knows of life and death and love and the same they say is a vulgarity End of Story 27